start right there and have you tell us just a little bit more about how you got into this work and why this is a topic that you choose to explore so much um, in your work. I'd be delighted. Uh, first, it's important to know that I've had quite a wide-ranging relationship history. <laughs> I've always been in great relationships with women. And over time, what I noticed is that I often hurt my relationships with women. I hurt the women I was loving and being with. And I didn't like it when that happened, but I noticed it occurring over and over again as a pattern. And eventually, and the women I was with were smart, powerful, sexy women. And, um, and from all appearances, it was a great relationship. But inside the relationship, there was something wrong. And the women kept being hurt. And I was kind of like, well, hey, if you, know, if you don't like being with me, um, that's fine. There's plenty of women who want to be with me. And they could pick me as I am or leave me. <laughs> and so they would adjust, you know, and they would go, okay, well, I want to be with you, so um, I'll adjust to who you are, until they couldn't anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the relationship would end, and I'd start over again. Finally, I was with a woman who said, enough is enough. Like, that is not okay. And she began educating me about narcissism. And I realized it was a tough realization, but when I realized that I had this pattern, it was kind of a shock. And I, so I handled it like I handle everything. I dived into the subject. I read everything I could. I tried to understand myself and understand this pattern. And I realized, oh my God, I am exhibiting narcissism. I never considered myself a narcissist. I was a nice guy. I was a spiritual guy. I was psychologically sophisticated. You know, I had all these great qualities that women loved. And yet I would make decisions arbitrarily, I would without unilaterally, without considering my partner, I would say I would walk away in an argument and say it's their problem. I would blame them for the issues that were going on. If I stopped liking them, I thought it was because of them. <laughs> yeah. So all of these patterns kept coming up. And when I really faced into what they were, I realized, oh my God, I'm a narcissist. And so I then began shifting my behavior and really uh, working to care more about my partner than I had been before. So I was what could be called a, uh, an incidental narcissist. Like I was a nice guy, except when there, I was stressed or distressed, when I felt unsafe or, or uh, suddenly got attracted to someone else. And then I exhibited all those characteristics. So uh, in the study that I've done and in the inner work that I've done, I realized that I could help a lot of men with their own narcissism and also women because women can also be narcissists. Um, and, and I could work with relationships. And so my partner, Chris, and I uh, created a program to help both men and women with this issue. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I would think that it uh, requires some deep um, introspection to be able to admit and to be able to recognize that that was a pattern you had going on. And I think, I think it would be helpful at this point, Lion, to have you tell us a little bit more about what you think narcissism actually is and some of the ways that it specifically manifests, particularly since this is an audience of women and many of these women, of course, would prefer not to be involved with narcissistic men, if at all possible. Um, so I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about it, because I think there's a lot of confusion around it. I don't think a lot of people really understand exactly what it is. And as I shared with you, I hear often from women, well, he's a narcissist, he's a narcissist, he's a narcissist. And I'm like, really, are all these people narcissists? I don't know. So speak to some of that, if you would. I'd be happy to. And this is really important, a uh, basic principle for everyone to understand, because the word narcissist is shorthand for narcissistic personality disorder. NPD is a very severe psychological uh, um, diagnosis that is difficult to treat. And people with NPD need to be seeing 
a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and it's a long-term issue. And the problem with NPD is that people who have it don't think there's anything wrong with them. So it's a very difficult issue. Now, narcissism itself, the word narcissism itself, basically means selfishness, self-absorption, self-focus. And so when you think about self-focus, there's a very wide spectrum from healthy self-care, that's self-focus, right? I'm taking good care of myself, to I care about myself and nobody else. So that spectrum is the narcissistic spectrum. And people can be on the mild side, as I was, which is, was more incidental. They can be in the moderate side, and they can be in the extreme side. So the extreme side is narcissistic personality disorder. That's not something we deal with. We're talking about the normal range of mild to moderate narcissism. We don't claim to be psychologists who can diagnose or treat NPD. That's for the experts. And if somebody's got NPD, that's you, you don't want to be in a relationship with a person like that. Um, in today's political uh, environment, um, you know, we, we have a great example of NPD. <laughs> I won't get political on us, but, but uh, you know, we can see what a true, per, a true narcissist uh, uh, looks and acts like. Um, in, in the political spectrum. And there's a lot of narcissists in politics and there's a lot of narcissists who are in, who are CEOs of companies. So narcissists tend, because they're so self-focused, they tend to be very successful, very pushy. They, they make things happen. So if you want to be with a successful person, you're likely to be with someone who's more narcissistic than not. Now on the other spectrum, we have codependency. Codependency is like the flip side of narcissism. And that's where the focus is on the other person instead of yourself. So at the extreme of codependency, you have someone who's so giving that they don't take care of themselves and they actually hurt themselves in relationship because they're focused so much on the other person. So these are kind of mirrors to each other. And both have a mild to moderate to extreme range. So when I'm talking about narcissism, I'm talking about what we call normal narcissism, that it can appear in anyone, men, women, children. And in fact, children are naturally narcissistic at a certain point in their development. Think about a two-year-old who says, no, <laughs> you know, that, that's the beginning, right? No, I'm not going to do that. Uh, all the way to a teenager who says, hey, I don't care about you. I'm, I'm just going to go do what I want to do. Now, we're supposed to grow out of that. We're supposed to, a child is supposed to recognize there are other people in the world. They do exist. They have needs and wants. And I have to kind of negotiate to get my needs met and to also meet their needs. That's maturity. When we mature, we recognize that there are other people in the universe and that we have to get along with them and that we have to share the universe with them. So that's, that's how we see narcissism and, and what we educate people about. Okay, so from what I heard is, just to recap, there's this extreme form of narcissism, which is a very serious psychological challenge and disorder, and that is on the extreme side of the scale. But what we're really focusing on here are the ranges on this closer to the other side of normal and perhaps uh, behaviors that might show up in all of us, at least from time to time and you defined it as selfishness. And so in terms of having healthy relationships, what are some of the things that you feel would be important for women to be aware of as they're getting to know a man and some of the ways that some of these behaviors might be manifest just so they know how to navigate what can seem like a bit of a minefield? It's a great focus for the conversation because uh, we need to be aware of our own narcissistic qualities and also the other person's narcissistic qualities because we all have them. We're all selfish at times. When I go to yoga class five days a week and I don't care what anybody else wants to do at that time, <laughs> that's my time. That's my self time, right? I'm self-focused. I'm self-focused for a good reason. I want to be healthy. You know, when I have my diet and I want to only eat the things I want to eat. That's selfish. On the other hand, it's healthy. So we're looking at healthy behaviors 
versus unhealthy behavior. So in a relationship, when a person, when, when two people are negotiating for what they want to do that night or what they want to do with their lives, if there's a give and take, that's healthy. We negotiate, we compromise, we, we care about each other's needs and wants. When it gets to be narcissistic, we stop caring. There's not a care for the other person's needs or desires or, or wants. So in a relationship, if there's an even flow of care back and forth with each other, that's healthy. And if one person's getting their needs met and the other person isn't, that's the unhealthy spectrum. So when you're, in a, when you're starting a relationship, there's always that honeymoon period, right? It's like there's romance and there's seduction and there's good sex and it's, you know, all those things happen. It's hard to determine whether a person's narcissistic or not because they're in the seductive giving role. And I happen to be very experienced at that role. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was a great seducer. Uh, <laughs> Once you got into a relationship with me, things change. It's like, okay, well, I accomplished my goal. And there's this, this thing called narcissistic supply, right? Narcissists go around and collect people and things that make them feel good about themselves. And so if a man is, is seducing you with all this charm, and narcissists can be very charming, by the way, uh, and then when you're, once you're in the relationship, it shifts, that's but the first warning sign, like, wow, he was such a nice guy, but now he's being an asshole. <laughs> That's a good sign that there's narcissism going on. And if that asshole behavior continues and the person's not caring about you now that he's got you, this is a, a warning sign to, to either remove yourself or, or see if he can be changed. Narcissism can be changed. The more extreme it is, the less likely it's going to be changed because a narcissist who's got who's out to get his supply of you know fast cars fast women <laughs> beauty uh, riches wealth um, once he's got it he doesn't care about it anymore so if if you're one of the things he's gotten and he's suddenly not caring about you that's a sign that you're in relationship with a narcissist so it's hard to tell at the beginning of a relationship that's my point you can tell as things progress, if you're feeling less cared for over time, there's a sign that narcissism is going on. Or if you happen to be the narcissist, which is quite possible, you are, you've got your partner and now you're not caring about his needs as much. That's also a sign for you to look and see, what do I need to do to, to make this change? Mm. Yeah, that, that's very, very interesting. And one of the things that came to mind as you were speaking, because I agree with you, I think it is difficult to recognize a narcissist in the early stages. And I agree with you, they can also be very, very seductive and very skilled in that area. So one of the things that occurred to me was that I think it makes a lot of sense in most situations even if there's a lot of chemistry and attraction and excitement in those early stages, wherever possible to slow things down a little bit and catch your breath. Uh, once I wrote an article, article called The Woes and Wonders of the Whirlwind Romance. And I talked about, you know, how it's exciting and it's intoxicating, it's almost irresistible. But oftentimes these relationships that start out like a wildfire ultimately end with us lying there in the dust, smoke, and ashes wondering what in the world has happened, right? <laughs> so I guess one of the things that might be helpful is just to have this awareness that it really does take some time to really get to know the heart, character, and qualities of someone. And before you go all in, there's usually some benefit of giving things a little more time on the, on the front end. That's been my experience in my own life. And also in working with other women. That's very wise. Um, and another way to tell is to ask the, the man about his other relationships, mm. especially his past relationships. Now, if he doesn't want to talk about them, that's a sign, right? But if you can find out what his relationships with his mother is or his father, uh, his sisters and brothers, his children, if he has children, 
this is really important information because if he has good relationships with his family, it's likely that he knows how to be a relational person. If he has bad relationships with his family, it's a sign that he's lacking some relational skills. So getting to know a person and, and their relationships, if he's blaming all the other people in his life for the bad relationships, that's a, a warning sign as well. That means he's not taking responsibility for his part in it. And it's always a two-way dance. So make sure that he has a good relationship. You can pretty much count on the fact that if he has a good, healthy relationship with his parents, his ex exes and his children, that he's got good relational skills. Things happen in relationships for, for them to end, but it doesn't mean that, uh, that he's got the skills necessarily if he's not showing evidence of having other good relationships. Mm -hmm. So here's another thought, and that is that I think when it comes to relationship, <laughs> what we have to look for over a period of time are patterns, because I think Anyone can have a, a bad or an off moment, but I think what we're looking for and what we're talking about here in terms of someone that might be displaying narcissistic behavior is more of a pattern of this. And uh, I'm curious to know, Lion, you said that narcissistic behavior can be changed. Now, I know we're not talking about the severe on this far end of the scale kind of behavior, that's much harder. But how does a woman know if she's in a relationship and she has a hunch that she's in a relationship with a narcissist, how does she know whether this is worth continuing to try to invest in this relationship or if it is possible for things to improve? It really depends on whether the man cares that he's hurt you. Mm. So if you express the fact that, wow, when you did that, that hurt my feelings, watch for his reaction. Because if he says, that's your problem, that's a sign of narcissism. Mm -hmm. If he said, oh, wow, I, I didn't recognize that I hurt you. I didn't, I didn't notice that. I'm, I'm sorry. That's a sign that the man can, be, can learn and grow in his, in his uh, relational skills. And if there's a repeated pattern where you get hurt and you report that you get hurt and the pattern repeats that he doesn't care or that he blames you or that he says it's your problem, that's the sign that, that he may not be able to change. Now, it might take some therapy. It might take some relationship counseling. It might take, you know, some other people involved in the system in order for him to wake up. But if there's a repeated pattern of uncaring, that's the sign that it's probably not going to get any better. Mm -hmm. If he says, wow, I, I didn't realize that, what can I do the next time? That's a sign that he's a learning, growing person and that he actually wants to change. He wants to care. Men are not trained to care. Women are kind of come into the world naturally caring, right? They they, they're relational beings. Their whole, their estrogenic brain is built on relationships. Men are trained to not care. You know, no pain, no gain. Don't express your emotions. Big boys don't cry. So our social and cultural programming actually reinforces narcissism. Narcissistic behavior is, is approved of by the society, especially for men who are, want to be successful in the world. You know, be successful, step on other people. It doesn't matter, you know, what happens. Just keep going and the hell with everybody else. Be the lone wolf, the, you know, the successful entrepreneur. Uh, so we have a lot of programming to do battle with. And we learn to care in our family of origin. If we are cared about by our mother or our father, we learn what caring is. Some of us had narcissistic parents, and a narcissistic parent really messes with your psyche. And you realize, wow, I'm on my own here. They don't care about me, or they're using me as, a, as some kind of tool for themselves, some narcissistic supply for, for them. So it teaches us how to be narcissistic. And then we get the cultural and social programming on top of that. So it's a big issue. It's, these patterns are deeply set and deeply programmed starting with our family of origin and then followed by school and, and 
clubs and sports and all these other things. So, you know, if someone's done team sports, uh, they're more likely to care about other people. If they've done solo sports, like, you know, long distance running, (laughs) <laughs> they, they, they don't, they, they may not have the relational skills that are required to be in a good relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would imagine a lot of this does stem from our family of origin and things that we've seen modeled and that some of these things may be going on beneath the surface without us even really being aware of it. And you already said women can be narcissists as well. I think that, there's a common perception that it's more common in men. Would you say that's true? Or do you think it's just uh, women don't recognize it in themselves as much? Uh, It is more common in men, and it is seen as a male characteristic more often. It doesn't mean that it can't be in women. It certainly can. And there are plenty of narcissistic women out there. All you have to do is look at at the the pages where women are, are, you know, exposing their beauty and they're using their bodies to seduce and they're, they're after their own narcissistic supply. Right. Um, so the question is really relational skills. Do you have the relational skills to engage in a relationship in which you care about other people? But we, we talked about the biological drive. Women are naturally more caring because of their, their brain structure. They're the, <clears throat> they're the ones that give birth and care for children. Uh, men are the ones that are going out hunting and <laughs> bringing home the meat or the money, right? Uh, women are the gatherers. They sit in circles and they, they, they communicate, you know, in circles. Men are communicate shoulder to shoulder. And basically we learn to communicate by grunting and pointing. <laughs> so, so, so we have fewer communication skills. We have fewer relational skills. And then, as I said, with all the cultural programming for you know win at all costs that reinforces the narcissism that is primarily male in our culture Mm -hmm. yeah and i would say you may be able to speak to this i would say that as a culture i think there's a lot of emphasis on the me and the the focus on you know what's in it for me and the it's all about me and what have you done for me lately and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, I think as a culture, there's been some shift in that direction. Whereas, at least from my perception, you know, from, from a historical standpoint, people were more in communities or groups or families and there was more of that emphasis on working well and playing well with others, so to speak. That's exactly right. We are the most narcissistic culture ever that's ever been on earth, I think. And uh, all you have to do is look at any crowd of people these days and it's, it's, everybody's doing this. They're not relating to each other, right? They're relating to whatever is interesting to them on their phone. And so it, uh, it is a cultural problem. And, and so we have to deal with it as a cultural problem as well as a personal problem. We all have to learn how to be more relational. We need to talk to people while standing in line instead of you know, doing our Facebook postings. Uh, we need to face each other in a restaurant and put our phones down and not be so self-focused, but actually find out, oh, there is another person over there. There's a whole universe right in front of me, and I could be interested in that universe and what's happening over there, not just this universe over here. So, yeah, it's, it's a cultural, social as well as personal and relational problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we might call it the selfie culture, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. How good do I look right now? Yeah. Well, and it's so interesting because another thing that I've heard a lot of women say that I've worked with is they'll say, well, I look at the Facebook pages of my friends or my past boyfriend or ex-husband or whatever. And, you know, they're living this wonderful, magical, perfect life. And I'm like, really? You know, that may be what they're putting out on Facebook. I doubt that's the full picture of exactly what's going on. And yet, you know, this ties back to what we're talking about, kind of this societal trend of kind of the selfie culture and wanting to make ourselves look good and avoid looking bad. And 
Sure, as human beings, we want to put our best foot forward, and there's some value to that. But I just think there's also value in being real and authentic and just saying, you know what? I had some problems in my life. Things are not always perfect for me. I think that's part of what makes us relatable. And I don't know if part of narcissistic behavior is hiding that or masking that or not being willing to show that side. When you look at the root of narcissism, what you find most often is shame. Shame. It's hard to recognize that because a narcissist is all that kind of bravado and look at me and aren't I great and look what I have and and what they're hiding is very deep inside shame about who they are. They feel bad about who they are. They feel inadequate. They feel put down. They feel like there's something wrong with them. Shame is essentially the belief that there's something wrong with me and it's so bad that if it's exposed, I will be rejected or abandoned. So I need to keep it a secret. And so down deep underneath the narcissist is this very scared little boy or girl that says, I have to make sure nobody finds out how broken I am. Nobody finds out how terrible a person I am. And then on top of that is all of the behaviors that, that say, look how great I am. Look how wonderful I am. Look how powerful I am. Look how many people love me. Right? Look how many Facebook likes I get. Uh, so it's, it's a psychological issue, and it needs to be handled at the psychological level with a good therapist or, or psychologist because a narcissist doesn't want to touch that. It's like they're doing everything they can to avoid it. And if you point to a narcissist and say, you're being narcissistic, what you're doing is you're shaming that person. You're, you're going in and poking that wound, and they're going to react negatively because they don't want that wound poked. They don't want to be exposed. That's what makes narcissism a difficult issue to handle because it's all based on a defense strategy against that, that deep, dark secret that they're keeping. So if you're going, if you're with a narcissist, you have to decide whether you're up for the challenge of helping them become healthy and helping them face their own deep, dark secrets. It's a tough challenge. It helps to be psychologically sophisticated, helps to be educated. That's why I wrote the book, The Narcissism Primer, to to help people understand these issues. Um, so if you're not up for that challenge, my suggestion is go find someone who's actually more relational because it is a big challenge to get someone to change from that very hard defense structure. Mm. Wow, I'm really glad you told us about that because I would have never really thought about it being steeped in shame. But that makes sense now that you explain it that way. So this is really a defense mechanism in many ways for them. And that goes along with the idea of them collecting women or them collecting toys or cars or whatever the case may be. This is all to reinforce that feeling that they want to have inside that would make them feel better about themselves and to help mask that underlying shame, right? Yep, that's, that's right. And so um, narcissism as a spectrum, right, is selfishness to narcissistic personality disorders very wide. As you said earlier, we all exhibit selfish behaviors from time to time. And when we're under stress or, or we're distressed, often those things come out, right? The, I'm going to take care of myself and the hell with you. Right. Right. And, and, if, and everybody has them. Women have them. Men have them. Children have them. The question is, what is the normal pattern? Can a person come back from that and say, I'm sorry? Now, I'm sorry is the, the key moment of switching from selfishness to unselfishness, from, self, from self-focus to other focus. Oh, I see I hurt you. I'm sorry I hurt you. I care about that. If that's happening in your relationship, that's a good sign. That means the person is recognizing that there's a you that they had impact on you and they care about their impact. So that's probably the single best measure of 
narcissism or its lack or where it is on the spectrum is do I care that because we we mess up, you know, we react to each other. We all have a wide range of reactions. If you remind me of my mother, I'm going to react to you as if you're my mother. You know, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. That's one of my favorite sayings. <laughs> so, um, so depending on what that relationship was, I may suddenly, re, you know, leave if I'm a withdrawing type or I may get escalated if I'm a, an anxious type. Uh, we also help people understand their attachment type because that's that's part of, of our psychological development is what we call our, your love style. Uh, and we, we offer a free love style profile quiz on our, on our website uh, so people can understand attachment theory and attachment disorders. Uh, so I'm going to, we, we all react to each other. That's the point. The question is what's the longer term pattern and can I recognize while I messed up? And so I want to reset So we teach people how to reset and, and bring that love, the love back into the relationship. Say, okay, I messed up. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Let's reset and let's start again in the, to care for each other and to make sure we are giving each other pleasure. So those are some of the things we teach people in how to repair and restore relationships when we mess up because we all mess up. One incident doesn't mean anything. A repeated pattern, that's something to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I'm hearing you, and I just want to recap because I really want to emphasize this for the women. If they're in a relationship with a man that they suspect is a narcissist somewhere on this scale, first of all, they have to decide whether or not they're up for the challenge of trying to support and help and work with that person and risk potentially having this person offend again. But also you're telling us that one of the key ways that they can know whether or not this is a possible situation they can work with is if this person has the capacity to have enough self-introspection to recognize or acknowledge when they've hurt the other person, when it's brought to their attention, and hopefully begins to adapt or reset, as you call it, some of the behavior patterns. And to me, it stands out that if they are able to do that, that's a start. But of course, if they say they're sorry, but continue on the same old path, they're not really sorry. And we're still dealing with a problem that might not be a workable problem, right? Right. If, if they say they're sorry, they actually might be sorry. Mm -hmm. The question is, can they change the pattern? And if there is a repeated pattern, you have to point to the repeated pattern and say, hey, every time this happens, you say you're sorry, which I appreciate. I appreciate your apology. But then it happens again. And that's not okay with me. So until unless the behavior changes, I, I can't do this. I can't be with you because I want to be with a person who has these qualities. I know you have them because that's part of what I love about you. And I need to see more of that and less of this for this to continue. Because if it continues, it means you're not changing. You're not willing to change. You're not willing to look at, at what's underneath it, underneath the pattern. Because that's the only way we can change a pattern as far as I can tell is by looking down underneath the pattern and seeing what it's made of. And you either have to change the behavior by just not doing that thing or doing something else, or you need to find the core of the pattern, pull it up and go, oh my God, that's what it's made of. I, now I want to heal that. So that's psychological healing, which we get in therapy, we get in belief change work. There's a lot of ways to get that. So I agree with you that the, the, the sorry might, if, if the sorry is just an offhand of sorry, that you can tell they're not really sorry. If you can feel them being sorry, they're, they're apologizing from a heart place, and you recognize that they see that they caused pain, that's a good sign. The question is, are they willing to do the, the work involved in changing their behavior? Mm. You know, I, I work with men's groups and, I, and have for 20 years. Men's groups are a place where men can go and deal with these patterns with other men. It's safer than dealing with them in a relationship. Or go to a psychologist, psychotherapist, uh, get some professional help. 
there's a lot of ways to change patterns. And men who are committed to changing their patterns are good men to be with because they're, they're learning beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask you um, another question that kind of swings back to something you mentioned briefly earlier in our conversation. And that was that one of the signs of a narcissist or someone who has narcissistic behavior is that once they seduce you or have you or have feel like they've um, conquered you, so to speak, in terms of a relationship or sexually, then sometimes they have a tendency to disappear. Now, of course, you know, Lion, this is a huge complaint of many women. They, you know, desire this intimacy and closeness. They have sex with a man and then poof, he disappears. So do you feel like that's narcissistic behavior or do you feel like that's just something that men do um i just want to help women navigate that whole landmine a little bit <laughs> it is a landmine it is something that i've seen in myself um i've seen in other men there, the culture of man is you know go out and conquer right that's one of the men manly things to do is to conquer a mountain or conquer uh you know in war or conquer a woman and get what you want uh Again, this is something that we're trained in. It's something that we're educated in. We're, we're, we, it's a culture that we're, is reinforced over and over. And that's part of the battle for women. So um, my suggestion for women is, you know, don't allow yourself to be conquered so easily. You know, make it, draw it out and, and make it, make the man have to work for it and see whether he hangs in there and actually wants you as opposed to just your body. It's really important because um, once the sexual revolution happened and sex became easy, men said, hey, I can, I can get what I want and need, and that's good enough, right? So it used to be that you had to court a woman, you know, and courting was, was a good process for getting to know someone and seeing how they did and where, did they have stamina to, to carry through that long period of time. Uh, so today, sex is almost uh, like a, a party favor, you know? <laughs> and it's given out freely and easily, and it shouldn't be. Uh, it is something that should be the result of a, of a relationship that's been building and, and, and working towards something. So it does take time to get to know someone. I, I personally think that six months is how long it takes to really get to know someone. Mm -hmm. A person can be can have a false front and a and and be charming for for months at a time, uh, but if they conquer you and they they disappear, that's a sign that it's not someone who knows how to be in a relationship. Wow, are you singing in my choir now? <laughs> I'm so glad that you said this, and I love having a man say this because I say this all the time to my women to slow that process down. And to really it require a man to invest in getting to know you and in a relationship. If you're looking for a long-term committed relationship, you can't be given the sex away like a, a party favor because it's not going to be appreciated. And in fact, I've even termed this whole thing unholy giving. Um, it can show up with sex, but it can show up in other ways where a woman gives way too much too fast too soon over-invest in the early stages of a relationship, and then she ends up feeling depleted and potentially used, and the man's not really appreciated what's been given because it's just been given without him really happy to step up and earn it. And this is not about game playing. This is about really having enough respect for yourself and having standards where if you want a relationship, you want to see how this person's going to show up over a period of time right like you said lion anybody can kind of put their best foot forward and be on nice nice behavior for a little while that's right uh, it, it is um i i hear what you said that it's not a game it, it's a if it is a game it's a serious game it's a game of, of long term you look at historically anthropologically and you know, social animals found ways of bonding. Right? So bonding is, is an important part of our human behavior. We bond with our children, uh, except in the 50s, they took babies away from their mothers uh, right after birth, and they put them in a bassinet, 
and let them cry. And so the baby didn't have the natural bonding that it's supposed to have. It didn't get what it needed right away. When a baby comes out of the womb, it needs to be put on the breast and held and say, it's okay, I've got you, I'm here, I love you, you're welcome here. That's what we all want. Every one of us wants that same relationship of security and, and care. And it doesn't change when we become adults. We still want to hear from our partner, I'm here for you, you're safe, I want you, I'm caring for you, I'm going to be here in the, for the long haul. You can relax, you can rest, you can rest in this care, you can rest in my love, you can rest in my protection and safety. So those needs are universal. And we grow up thinking, well, I have to just take care of myself. No, we are relational creatures. We are in relationship with each other. We need each other. And when we start using each other as tools, that's when it gets bad. It's like, I'm just going to use you to get what I need and the hell with you and your needs. So this is where we all need to grow into. We need to grow into this understanding that safety and security is what actually allows us to relax and open and that when a, when a woman feels safe, she can open her body, right? When she feels unsafe, she can't. Men can have sex, you know, at a moment's notice. <laughs> they don't need to feel safe. It's like, uh, it's just, it's almost a biological function. It's like, okay, I need to come. Great. Thanks. See ya. <laughs> so, so um, but even men, it turns out that men too need that feeling of safety and security. We're not taught that, but biologically we need that. And what happens in a long-term relationship is you feel the safety and security, which allows passion to emerge for the long haul. It's not the quick, lusty come that, that we all want, right? It's fun to do that. But what we're really looking for as biological beings is long-term safety, security, and, and openness, vulnerability, the ability to care for each other and be in a, in a primary bond that lasts and that's what makes for good families and that's what makes for a good society and a good culture and it's something that we all need to learn because it's not we're not taught that in school we're not taught that and you know we nobody got relationships 101 you know we should have right I, I still hope someday that we we get that down in the elementary schools and the junior high schools and the high schools uh, including how to end a relationship well nobody knows how to do that either so we all kind of fumble around with the beginnings, the middles, and the ends. And uh, it, it's, it's all part of education. We need to educate ourselves and each other. Mm. Yeah, I think this is a really, really wonderful conversation, Lion. And I'm so glad that we've had the opportunity to have it. It's been a really interesting um, experience for me to uh, speak with you and have you share your thoughts on this. And I'm sure it's going to be beneficial for so many women. So Lion, tell us your last bit of wisdom or your last thought before we sign off. Thank you. It's, it's really great to be here and, and to help women worldwide uh, with these issues. My last thoughts are directed toward you as a woman, and that is that you deserve to be cared about. And you may not have ever heard that from a man. Uh, some of us had parents that didn't care about us. And uh, some of us had fathers that were absent or were mean. And so I want you to know that you deserve to be cared about. And in your relationships with men, you deserve to be cared about and cared for. And that deep deserving should make itself evident in the behavior in a relationship. We all make mistakes. We all uh, get reactive from time to time. But there should be a continuing growth in the care that exists between you and your partner. And if the care isn't both ways, it may mean that you are in a relationship with a narcissist, or it may mean that you're a narcissist. <laughs> so, so find out what that means. Find out what the pattern means. And you can change yourself, and you can help others change if they're open to change. So my suggestion is learn this material understand human behavior, realize that you deserve to be cared about, and that a good relationship 
means that you're being cared about almost all the time. Mm. Thank you, Lion. I love that you ended on that note, and I really appreciate you reminding the women of that because I too believe, ladies, that you deserve to be seated at the banquet feast of love. And that's my whole intention in the work that I'm doing in the world and in creating this series to hope to promote healthier and happier relationships. So, Lion, thank you so much for joining us. It's really been lovely to have you, and I've really enjoyed our conversation. It's a pleasure, Michelle. Thank you so much. Bye-bye for now.